Welcome to Hot Takes. Is this episode three or four, Sam? I think it's three. I think it's, if it's not, um, inject number here. Yeah. So, yeah, three. Three it is. It is now officially three. We'll just switch things around. I don't know why for a Tuesday, but I have low energy today. So, we're going to try to. Uh, yeah, I have I'm more right. energy. I have more. I'm on the road. I don't know why. Maybe Normally, I hide in my room. I'm actually in a hotel room right now, so that's why they didn't have the normal headset. But yeah, maybe we'll we'll switch energies then. Or I'll I'll try to keep my energy up for the next 20 minutes as we talk. But, um, cool. And you're out at Gartner. I'm at Gartner in London. So it's the Security and Risk Conference, and uh, I did a keynote today. That was kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah, what was the keynote about? I- it was well. It's predictably it was about zero trust, um, but it was about. Um, uh, cu- you know, cutting through the hype. Uh, and actually, I was joined on stage by a really cool CISO. Um, so Don Marie Hutchinson of BAT came and joined me for a fireside like chat. And we decided to not smooth it over, not be like, ooh, this is how it always goes. It was like, so I did like a little 10 minutes on what is it and what isn't it. And um, and then we sat down to talk about how does it really go? And, and the big challenges are cultural as well. Not It's not tech because you can do that. You can make a digestible program to go through maturity and so on, but they're cultural and um, social. And so what is that like? What was that like for her? What's it like for others? And, and the audience, I, at least no one walked out. So that's good. But you, but you can, I, I, I'm joking, but you can usually tell, um, I heard this advice once for somebody who wanted to do a Ted talk. I wish I could remember who did it. If we, if we remember, we'll put it in the comments. They said, if you do a Ted talk, it's not whether you get a standing ovation or not. It's how many people come and come and swarm on you afterwards and follow you. It's it's the press of people that actually want to connect with you. And so afterwards, both both Don Marie and I had like people coming up to talk to us for a solid 15, 20 minutes. So so that means I think cool. it went well. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's a great measurement of it going. Yeah, don't judge whether people clap, because you could be in a culture where nobody says anything, no questions, and you know, there's just right. silence in the room and you're like, oh, that didn't work. But <laughs> but, but if, if everyone comes up to talk to you afterwards and gives you their business card or shakes your hand or whatever, um, and they're like, I got one little question, and it is a big question has happened today with a couple of people, um, then you know, you hit, you hit the right nerve. Cool. Did you find, what was the mix of personalities that came up after? Was it oh, leaders? Oh, every, or was every, it? Well, every kind. Um, let's see. Uh, I had somebody from, like, an, like a, somebody who works in the, in the compliance department for a Japanese company. Um, cool. had somebody for a British company here who is a, um, uh, deputy chief information security officer. Um, I had people come up, of course, who are in the market, who are in the cyber, the selling market who also had questions about zero trust, not like competitors or anything, but people were like, right, right, Oh, right. I hadn't thought of that. And like, you know, we're, we're highly relevant to some of the things you talked about. So yeah, it was good fun. That's really cool. That that many people came up after, mm-hmm. especially, especially it wasn't because of me. It's because of Don Marie. I mean, she's the cooler one. Right? Uh, <laughs> and I was sort of interviewing her. So she had like lots of really cool things to say. Yeah. yeah that's, a, that's a very sad thing. Not take any credit for it. <laughs> it's actually true though. Like she, she, she was awesome. Yeah. Um, that kind of transitions to another topic, I, which is sort of tangent related, which is build versus buy mm. technology. And the reason it's on my mind this week, it's like zero. Because you want to acquire a company with all those billions of dollars you have. Yeah. People yeah, don't know yeah, that exactly. about you, by the way. Yeah. No, you know that scene in Breaking Bad where uh, the two. Oh, you've got uh, a pile of cash in the garage the that you don't know what to do with. Yeah. The, yeah. So I got that in my garage. You launder it through cyber. That's what you do. Yeah. That's what I do. Yeah. I'm actually a money launderer. Wink. wink yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely getting audited this year. Yeah, you're, yeah, you definitely are. It's better you than me, although now they may get me too. Thanks for that, Jacob. Yeah, yeah. Um, so build versus buy is mm. a topic that's been on my mind on tech because from my perspective, I get a lot of folks that ask, should I build or should I buy a solution? Or can you compare to what we would build? For the answer to that is buy? Yes. And it wasn't ever, right, it wasn't ever really a question at the company you and I previously worked at, because you- We did both. We did buy a company, if you recall. That's true. Um, But from a people we sold to perspective, no one ever said, should I build my own ER tool? It's a false dilemma, though. I'm I'm serious. It's a false dilemma. Right, and I think that's my point, and I don't know how to get that across to technical people. I think people who get into- 
see positions understand that part of the battle is about resource management. The things you buy, it's not, you could build anything you want in this world. Anyone, I'm of the opinion, anyone with time more than anything can build anything they want. Yeah. Yeah. Infinite, and, infinite number of engine, infinite number of engineers or, or anything and infinite amount of time. And yeah. Uh, yeah, infinite amount of monkeys can write. I, I was avoiding that word because I said Shakespeare. Though. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Shakespeare. but you, it, the lower down you go, so a, a director level person usually gets this pretty well too. Yeah, a manager sometimes yeah. mm-hmm. gets like they start to understand it at a management level, but an individual contributor, I wouldn't go that especially far, technical going, ones, yeah. mm-hmm. almost always think that they could build it over by. Everybody does. And everybody, everybody does. It's, it reminds me of that meme. We we don't build this. Uh, because we, because, uh, because it's hard, we, we built it because we, we thought it would be easy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I think there's a lot of confusion that people think that it's because the vendor or other people think they've done something someone else couldn't. And like, that's not the case. It's about time management. It's about resource management. It's about sometimes vendors do do things that other people couldn't. It's rare though. Let's be honest. There's, there's great engineering talent at many, many, many places. Yeah. And it's about how you use that engineering talent to achieve your strategic objectives. That's people I don't think quite grasp. In yeah, but it's, mo- it's more than just the jelly bean counting and t-shirt sizing, right? Um, t-shirt sizing referring to work effort. I'm sorry. Yeah. So yeah, I, what I mean by that is in the agile sense of, of job estimation, uh, tech debt, et cetera. And NIH, I mean, so I have been involved in many, many acquisitions, but I've actually presided over or been acquired as a senior person in 14 mm-hmm. acquisitions of which two worked. And I'm told that's a good ratio. Like, I mean, by work, I mean that like, they actually achieve what they set out to do. Several right. failed, several did uh, <laughs> not so well. But, and that may sound horrific to people listening, but the reason these things fail is actually not to do with the tech either. It, in post merger integration, too many companies, they, I, <laughs> so I have a boss years ago, Art Coviello, and I don't mind mentioning him this, mentioning this because he'll have a chuckle. I tried to get a company acquired. And when I was at RSA, not once, not twice, but three times. And he looked at me and he said, Sam, you can't strap two drunks together and expect them to walk a straight line. <laughs> what he meant was not that we were drunks, but that, that, that what I was doing was, was like, take the best of this, the peanut butter, and mix it with the best of that, the chocolate, and you get something awesome. Sometimes it's toothpaste and, and, and mouthwash or, or, you know, a mouthwash and orange juice or toothpaste or whatever. You know what I mean? Right. right. Sometimes it doesn't go together. And, um, PMI is only part of it is does the tech fit and can you sustain it and can you can you merge it uh, things like I've never found even after due diligence a company that didn't put too much hope on their version four and, and remember that number version four everyone's got a version four because they got to version three by the time they were successful and all the hope is on four and then the acquiring entity gets blamed for why four failed I've never <laughs> also yeah. seen an acquisition um, succeed. Where, where the acquirer didn't ask, what do we do for the acquired entity? Not the reverse, right? How does their business model get sustained and affected and grow? Unless it's an acqui hire or a tuck-in, in which case the, the multiples are pretty low. Um, right, right. You know, it's, it's a diff- it, different objective when you're talking acqui hire. Yeah, you, you got to you got to align more than just the tech and the market fit. You've also got to align the culture, the strategy. And, and, and frankly, how the customers, are they common? And by which I mean, do they buy the same way? Are they part of the same RFPs? Are they even adjacent to each other? Do they get from the same channel? Like these are big questions because otherwise you will derail your own business model by absorbing it. I love to hear. By jamming it into the sales team and then you've broken two sales processes and you have zero effective way to get revenue. A hundred percent. And so if you go out and buy big companies, I'm not pointing at anyone, but let's say a big company for $28 billion, you better be sure that both right. sales forces can still execute yeah. right. and have a hopefully peanut butter and chocolate combinatory effect. It's far right. more effective, by the way, sometimes when you partner. I think it, maybe this is a naive comment and, and slap me if it is. Mm-mm. I think the armchair analysis of Cisco and Splunk that's oh. everywhere right now is pretty comical because it's a scale. Oh, everyone's opinion. got an opinion. Me too, by the way. You too. Yeah. Right. Uh, of course I have an opinion. My, my opinion, uh, uh, though, on just on the next level up of watching everyone talk about is like, this is at a scale that no one else is. It's the largest acquisition ever. And Cisco is a unique company in the marketplace. Is it large no. ever or large in our industry ever? Right, right, right. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. It's large in our industry ever. Yeah. And that there is no 
playbook for how this will execute. And the reason Cisco does things is not the reason any other company does things at this yeah, point because they're in a total different market fair. space. Yeah. Um, so people compare it to the reason why they would acquire someone or why they want their company to be acquired. Or it, The lens is so different that people are applying so, to it than the reality of the Cisco lens. So one of the things I thought we might talk about today has suddenly just become relevant in this context. It's there's a constant debate of best breed versus suite. Right. Which is a great add on to build for spy. Yeah. And, and the, the reason I bring it up is because every industry, but cyber, so park cyber to one side goes through a best of breed phase until it only differentiates on cost because eventually right. everybody builds all the features at which point you get a consolidation People start to buy up ERP did this, right? Product mm -hmm. so, or, or office productivity did this with like Microsoft Office, right? There were others as well. And, and you suddenly got word, you suddenly got like word processing mixed with spreadsheets, mixed with, 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 with the generic term PowerPoint, but with slides. And, and that happens. So you go to, then you, so you right. differentiate on cost and then the big, then you get these bigger companies and bigger companies buying things up. Mm -hmm. Now let's, now let's deal with the case of, of cyber. My hypothesis for people to consider, and, and this is part of the arrogance that non-cyber people perceive in our space, is that because we have an opponent, innovation is required, and therefore differentiation is always possible, especially by startups who have very focused. And innovation is very hard to do by the large companies who typically, and they differentiate with enterprise license agreements, by the way. That's how they do it. They're like, oh, you want it all you can eat from us? We'll give you that. And then they get into the multi-billion range. And what this means is that the security industry or cybersecurity, information security, whatever, barbells, the middle is teeny, teeny, teeny because the big companies buy them. And when they can't, when they can't innovate, you get this long tail of thousands of companies. We have had thousands of companies in the long tail for 25 years. Right. And so along comes somebody from the classic school saying, well, every other industry is. Well, you know what? Every other industry doesn't have an active opponent trying to kill you or kick you down or steal your money. And that is exactly what happens here. And that innovation on the other side, because there is another side, leads to innovation on this side and a healthy, robust startup uh, mentality. And what that means is that occasionally one of those gets big enough to disrupt the bigger players. We saw it in Endpoint. We saw it in IAM. We saw it in mm -hmm. SIM. And so if your strategy is to become a conglomerate in cyber, as we've seen several players do over these, IBM tried it, Oracle tried it, Cisco has tried it, right? If that's your, if that's your play, you had better be pretty good at either innovation or buying up tuckins and figuring out how to be a machine that does that. And that is not something that anyone has become good at consistently over a long period of time. No, it's the, uh, the same issue I see with investors in cyber companies. It's you're applying a generalized MBA playbook. Sorry, I don't mean that to be offensive mm -mm. To, to MBA people. Mm -mm. Um, I think, I think they'll be okay with that one. Uh, but yeah. To, so, uh, to an industry which it doesn't truly apply. So, so this is neat. So you, what you want is the benefits of a suite for interoperability while getting the innovation of a focused player in each yep. of the pockets in cyber until we actually defeat the bad guys. And then the conglomeration will happen and, and, and then the suites will dominate. So you want, you have to, and this is an important point. If you are an, if you are a buyer, what you should be doing is, is forcing vendors and they hate this forcing vendors to be interoperable. And I mean, from a standards perspective, policy perspective, uh, reporting, um, mm -hmm. thing, things like threat Intel sharing, like, and, and I don't just pay lip service to it. Um, when I say interoperability, I mean functionally interoperable. And I might be showing my hand that some people will be annoyed that I do this. Some people on the sales side of the business, but when you're negotiating at the end and you want that interoperability, make sure that you state that very clearly and whether you contingent renewals on that or remember from the us the vendor side of the world we will do anything for revenue <laughs> you can make us do things for revenue <laughs> and so someone's gonna be mad that i'm saying that on oh yeah someone coming out there screaming how could you jacob you let it out no yeah, everybody yeah, my, my cro is screaming at me tomorrow no no uh, you, you're, you're not in that. cyber you're just you know, you're, a, you're a storage player i don't know what well, i'm just yeah, i'm just a storage. person that floats around That's look but, you know, but what's really important here is when someone is trying to sell you an ELA or to tell you that they have the suite of the future, they may have a platform with a lot of growth potential, but do they respect people in adjacent areas or is it eventually a world they intend to conquer and they're trying to lock you in? Because I used to work at CA. There were those that were CA shops and only bought from CA. 
and there were those that were not. And and yeah, that yeah, yeah. mentality, if you put shop after any vendor, something's off, you know? Mm. Something is off. So, by the way, so if you find yourself buying something where they are a walled garden in enterprise, and it's and it is not a commoditized space, meaning the only differentiator is cost, then you are in a situation where is the features that is the feature that you're really getting so compelling that it's worth signing away your ability to work with others. And that's the trade-off you need to make. And so my advice as well is when you're doing the RFPs, put this in. Like, don't mm-hmm. even wait to the negotiation phase you're, phase you're talking about. Put it oh, in yeah, that they yeah, have right, to work right, with certain right. standards. Like, or, or they have to, they have to work what nicely with others in your ecosystem. Name them as spaces. Name it. You know, identity, um, sim, endpoint, zero trust. These are important. This is why I'm a big proponent of data lakes when a lot of people are naysayers on data lakes is because it promotes interoperability between tech stacks mm-hmm. versus vendor lock-in on a oh, yeah. tech stack from a detection perspective. I've seen it's people really, say they have data lakes. What they really have is pockets. It's like data puddles. You know, Data puddles. Like, yeah, right. right. D- data lakes are, I guess, a pet subject of mine. Well, I had somebody say to me, oh, you know, we have a data lake, but we really have small sample sizes in several different locations. I go, that's not a lake. That's puddles. Yeah, you can't do data analysis across when you have to have a human instead of technology. Do the data analysis across it. It's not a data lake. Um, maybe that's a good spot to end it. 